Adventure is something most people are fond of. Going on a trip with friends to explore an area that you aren't familiar with always sounds like a great idea. Except sometimes, things don't go as planned. Whether you're going to a ghost town just to see what you can find, or going hiking in a group just to hang out, there is always the possibility something can go very, very wrong. In today's video, we will be going over two stories detailing exactly that. A huge thank you to the writers for allowing me to narrate their stories. Links to their original stories are in the description. If you enjoy the video, be sure to drop a like rating and a comment letting me know your thoughts. Enjoy the video, and as always, I hope you all have a great night. I am not the adventurous type. In fact, I am quite the introvert. I prefer to spend my nights alone in my house with my dog. Boring, I know. But we find things to do, especially now that Red Dead 2 has come out. I have always been like this though. Shy, socially awkward, constantly stumbling over my words when I talk to a pretty girl. So inherently, I learned it's less stressful when I don't go anywhere. I will admit, however, it is nice to go out from time to time and socialize. That's where my friend Raymond comes in. Ray and I have been friends since the second grade. He is pretty much the opposite of me. Ray is always doing something. Kayaking, rock climbing, going on dates with girls. It's always fun hanging out with him. The only reason I ever did go out is because he would usually convince me to. That's why it's unfortunate that I haven't seen him in a while. 15 months to be exact. We're still friends and all. We text every now and then and like each other's Facebook posts. But we haven't hung out in quite a while. And it's mostly my fault. It became too hard to see him like he is now. Besides, in the past 15 months, other than work and the store, I have left my house maybe 10 times. I too am trying to get over what happened that day. It was July 16th, 2017, around 8am when my phone began to ring. Busy in my usual routine, nothing, I answered it. Hello? My dull and groggy voice even bummed me out. Wow, don't sound so happy. His excited tone was slightly distorted, as if he had me on speaker. Hey, since you're not busy. He continued, how about you come with me? I was only on the phone with him for 30 seconds, and I was already having more fun than I was before he called. What are you talking about, man? I've got quite the busy schedule ahead of me today. Really? He knew better. Okay, where are we going? I asked, partially ashamed. We're going to head up north for a few hours, into the desert. He had an inflection in his voice that carried determination. I did some reading this past week and found out about this old mining town out in Nevada. I was a bit shocked. I was expecting him to say something along the lines of a bike ride or maybe hitting some balls at the driving range. Not traveling state lines into the hottest part of the country. Nevada is kind of far, Ray. Once again, my hermit-like tendencies tried to take over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New York's far. Nevada is just a few hours away. Ray talked to me for about two minutes telling me how cool it was going to be, and all the history that was out there. When the phone was hung up, it was agreed that he would pick me up in about 30 minutes. With my backpack full of water bottles and a few cliff bars slung over my back, I waited outside for him. That old beat-up red Chevy S10 he pulled up in was just as dirty as ever. I threw my pack into the bed of the truck and climbed in. I buckled up and we took off, heading up the 91 freeway to the 15 North. We drove and we drove. Only stopping once, it took us about four hours to get to Las Vegas. That's where I realized how hot it was. 105 degrees. I couldn't believe it. It was so hot, I didn't think that water could save you from dehydration out here. Another 20 miles, Ray exclaimed as we got north of Vegas, still on Interstate 15. When we finally pulled off the highway, I was relieved. I thought we were just about there. 
Oh, how I was wrong. We drove for another two hours to a small dusty little town in the middle of the desert, surrounded by mesquite bushes, sagebrush, cactus, and crows there wasn't much to see in the town of Alamo. We didn't even stop to check it out. Almost as if he knew exactly where we were headed, Ray turned off the main street of Alamo and onto a dirt road. That's pretty much where I lost all sense of direction. I can't even remember if we turned left or right onto the dirt road. A bumpy, dusty, hot drive, but cool nonetheless. Living in the city and not getting out much, I don't see Mother Nature all that often. It was quite pretty out there. There's something about the desert that is powerful. It's vast in ways a lot of scenery is not. Off the distance, I could see the top of a wooden structure. And that's when the road ended. Dead ending into a small wall of desert plants, Ray put the truck in park, and we got out of the trusty old S10. Instantly, I felt as though I was going to die. It was extremely hot. It felt like my skin was blistering from the sun rays. My blood felt like it was boiling. Ready? Ray smiled at me like he didn't feel the heat. Without saying a word, I threw my pack on and started to walk towards the structure. The heat, it was deadly, but the excitement of actually exploring made it bearable. I glanced at my phone. Of course, no signal. Along with that, it was 3.15 p.m., probably the hottest part of the day. We hiked up a small hill. When at the top, we could see a few dilapidated wood structures placed in a line. The rooftop of the building we saw from the truck was on the adjacent hill. The small valley that lay before us was completely deserted. That two-story building on the other hill is the shaft house. Ray informed me as we started to walk down the hill towards the first structure in this tiny valley. Shaft house. What's that? The moisture was being sucked out of my mouth by the ambient atmosphere. Lumbering down the hill, we finally got to the first building. The structure was about 30 feet by 30 feet, and stood about 8 feet tall. Most of it was made of stone, only the roof was made of wood. It's for the mine shaft. We were pulling on the door to the stone structure trying to pry it loose. That's kinda cool. How did you find out about this place? For some reason, I didn't ask this on our 6 hour drive. National Geographics. Ray said as the door finally creaked open with a dusty plume of dirt. This place was mining in the late 1800s, but the railway was built on the other side of the mountain. By 1921, they all left. I gave a little smirk. So we're in a ghost town? Yeah. They said the last thing built was the house on top of the shaft. Unfortunately, there was absolutely nothing in the first structure we went into. It was just an empty large room with a dirt floor, but it was nice to get out of the sun for a minute. We walked past the ruins of two other buildings. All that was left was the first two feet of the stone coming off the ground. The next building we went into was different than the last. This one had multiple rooms, all of them small. There was some illegible graffiti on the walls, and trash all over the floors. It was obvious that some people had been here since 1921. In the second building, we found nothing, but we lingered for a few more minutes to stay in the shade. I have never been in temperatures like that before. The excitement was wearing off and the exhaustion was taking over. While sitting inside of the old abandoned building, pounding water and trying to eat a cliff bar, Ray continued to relay what he read about the place. On the other side of that shaft house and down the hill is supposed to be a cemetery, with about 20 bodies buried there. Weird, I thought. 20 bodies? There was only about 7 buildings here. Why so many? Probably the heat, or maybe snakes. I could tell I was losing my mind in the heat. Let's check out the shaft house, I said after deciding I couldn't eat this pasty bar of protein. Squinting as we stepped out into the blaring sun, we both walked slowly up the hill. The rest of the buildings were just footprints of stone left behind. We walked past them in a hurry. The sun was deadly and we knew our prize, Shade, was waiting for us. 
This hill was steeper than the last. The gravel was much looser as well. We slipped and slid to the top of the hill. With the shaft house to our left, a warm blast of air touched the sweat on our faces. It felt good. In the small valley below us lay stacks of rocks. Assumedly, these were just markers for the graves. It didn't look to be 20, but there was a few. All of this was observed in a split second. As soon as we hit up the top of the hill, we quickly clambered into the shade of the shaft house. We were only outside for about one minute and I already felt dehydrated. While digging through my pack for a bottle, we walked in the already open front door. Wow, we both said at the same time. It was almost hotter on the inside of the building. The little breeze we had outside was non-existent in here. When the room we were in came into focus, we could see a much different sight than what was inside the other structures. Still disappointed with the realization that there was nothing cool in any of these buildings. We saw that the shaft house had a large abundance of trash. There were newspapers dating back to 1987. I saw a cornucopia of old cans. Some with pull tabs, some with pop tabs, and some even made of tin. There were empty cans of beer and empty cans of soda. Along with the cans and paper trash, there were random torn up articles of clothing. A few shoes and socks. The foundation of the floor must have been made of broken glass. It seemed that there was more broken glass on the floor than there could ever be windows in the building. It was apparent that people have taken up residence in this vacant part of the desert recently. Together we walked down the spray painted hallway. This graffiti was much newer than the other stuff. I could read what most of it said, but it was just a bunch of bad words. When we got to the middle of the hall, we reached a doorway that was missing the door. A strange blast of cool air climbed out of it. We both stopped and stood there for a second to enjoy the cool air. The other side of the threshold was pitch black, but Ray took a few steps in anyways, and I followed suit. With it being so dark, it was a surprise when I took my first step down. It was a staircase, and we were climbing down it. Down into the cool darkness of the basement. We took about 20 steps down. With each step, it seemed that the temperature dropped a degree, making it about 80 degrees when we got to the bottom. It was a great reprieve from the outside temperatures. In the pitch black of the basement, I took a moment to gather myself as Ray shuffled around in his pack. Like a nuclear explosion, I saw a flash of light before I went blind. Not permanently blind. Ray dug an LED flashlight out of his bag. Eyes focusing, the room came into view. It was a large dirt room with lumber lining the walls. There were two metal beams on either side of the room, and both of them connected to another large beam horizontally at the roof of the basement. The beam on the right was anchored to the floor next to what looked like a skeleton of an old motor. It had been picked of all working parts, covered in spider webs and dust, but still it resembled an old motor. The size of the basement seemed vast and empty. In the center of the room on the floor were pieces of plywood, more old newspapers, and the missing door from the top of the stairs. These beams must have been how they lowered people down. My small voice sounded large and deep inside the vacant basement. Slowly Ray took a step towards the center of the basement. I wonder what they were mining out here. Ray took another step as he pondered out loud. I was basking in the coolness of the basement as I sat on the last step. Where do you think the shaft is? I don't know. Ray said slowly as he took a step. Beaming his light, tracing the beam of metal across the ceiling. The article was a lie, man. I replied while my eyes also followed his beam of light. It appears so. Ray took another slow and methodical step. Almost to the center of the underground room, Ray's foot softly came down on the door that was on the floor. There was a loud crash. Ray yelled as he fell through the floor. His beam of light went flailing and rolled against the wall. It all happened so quickly, I don't even remember seeing it happen. Just a loud noise and the silence is all I can recall. It was brutal. It was going to kill me. The silence was all there was. What the hell just happened? I thought as I stared into the darkness. 
Scrambling on my hands and knees, I crawled to the flashlight, trying my hardest to focus the light beam in the direction that I wanted. I searched for the hole that Ray fell through. Next to the door on the floor was a dark gap in between the plywood and the door. I grabbed one end of the door and pulled it towards the wall. All of a sudden, the mystery of where the shaft had gone was solved. Removing the two pieces of plywood, the door, the shaft was revealed. About four feet wide, the dark hole was extremely intimidating. Having just swallowed my friend, I approached the edge cautiously, practically lying on my belly. I forced the jittering flashlight beam down the hole. Beads of sweat dripped off my nose and eyebrows as I turned my head down to look. The confirmation that Ray fell down the hole was immediate as I looked at his lifeless body. Seeing this made me panic and fear took over my mind. Like a crab, I scurried up the stairs backwards with my hands, half crawling and half running, tripping up every step. I couldn't believe it. Ray's dead. Entering the floor level, I hardly noticed the change in temperature. Breathing laboriously, my chest heaved in and out. My eyes darted back and forth the dirty hallway, and sweat saturated my skin as though I had just gotten out of a pool. What the hell do I do? It all came crashing down on me. My paranoid self took charge and started to make a checklist of why I'm screwed. Your friend's dead. You don't know where you are. It's a thousand degrees. You're almost out of water. You're going to die. You never should have left the house. I had to stop thinking like that. That's what's going to get me dead. Like Ray. That's right around the time I shed a few tears. I was in complete panic and shock. After about five minutes of feeling sorry for myself, I forced my way back down the hallway and towards the basement door. Once again, that inviting cold blast of air hit me. As if each step could kill me, I took the stairs slow and cautiously. I had the flashlight focused on the hole at the bottom of the stairs as I descended. Before I knew it, I was back at the shaft, begging God that Ray was okay. That damn shaft still haunts me to this day. I walked to the edge and looked down it again. Still, Ray was lying crumpled up 20 feet below me in this hole. There was a blue tarp on the ground with him and more empty cans. The silence of it all was the worst part. I wanted to hear anything. A moan, a cough, even a fart. Anything that would tell me he was still alive. But there was nothing. Blankly, I stared at Ray and tried to formulate a plan. Ray's backpack was next to him at the bottom of the shaft. I remember seeing him put his truck keys in the small zipper. So driving out of here was a no-go. It was much too hot to walk back down the road we came from. I would have to wait till sundown. I figured the best thing for me to do was to find some rope. If I could find some, I might be able to lower myself down there somehow. What would I do when I got down there? I had no idea. But it was a plan. I couldn't not try to get him. I would sling the rope around the metal beam and use it as a pulley to hoist his body out of there. Up the stairs in a flash, I searched the entire first floor. Nothing but trash. This place was disgusting. I went up to the second floor. The stairs were rickety and felt quite unsafe. The risk of dying on them was not worth it, and I was sorely disappointed realizing that there was nothing up there. In too much of a panicked state, I didn't care that the sun was beating down on me. I walked out of the shaft house and down the small hill. I passed the other two structures remembering that there was nothing inside of them, and stormed my way up to the first hill we came across. From the top of the hill, I took a second to look around for anything. In a full 360, I saw nothing other than that ghost town, Ray's truck, and a never-ending hilly surface covered with desert. The truck was just as useless as the rest. Searching through it made me realize how hot it actually was, and how thirsty I was getting. Solemnly, I walked back to the basement where my backpack was. A wave of helplessness washed over me as I sat in the cool basement, waiting for nightfall. It was only 5.30 p.m., and I still had another four hours at least before it started to cool down. I sat in the basement on the last step in the complete dark, 
My mind ran every possible outcome it could think of past me. The horrible things my brain thought of were terrifying, but possible. While walking for help, I could get eaten by a ravenous pack of coyotes. I could trip, break my ankle, and bake in the sun. I could get completely lost out there looking for the small town of Alamo, and spend the next few days walking in circles in the barren, dry, harsh desert, slowly dying of dehydration. Without even realizing it, I began to nod off. Slowly, my thoughts became a movie in front of my eyes. All the horrible things I could think of happening to me were being shown to me by my tired, dreaming mind. Not sure of how long I slept for, but I woke up to what sounded like a person. At first, I thought it was just in my mind, resonating from my dreams. And then I heard a loud moan, groggy and confused. I opened my eyes. Another groan followed by a cough. Ray was alive. My heart began to pound as I fumbled for the flashlight sitting in my lap. Hello? Ray said in a broken, choked voice. I'm, I'm here. I frantically said as I leaned over the edge and beamed the light down the hole. Oh my god, man. I thought you were dead. My voice was filled with joy and relief, but had a light's underlining of panic in it. What happened? Ray couldn't remember much. His memory stopped at the moment we pulled up to this dead town. After a few minutes of talking, Ray told me he thought his left leg was broken, and he had a lot of pain on the left side of his chest. When I threw him down a bottle of water, I asked him to look around the hole for a rope or something we could use to pull him out of the hole with. Although feeling a lot of panic, I was extremely relieved that Ray wasn't dead. I began to dig around my backpack for a cliff bar for him. Then I heard the worst sound of my life. It sounded like Ray was dying a thousand deaths, screaming and yelling at the top of his lungs. I heard Ray moving at the bottom of the pit, shuffling his way through the tarp. As quickly as I could, I dropped my pack and looked down at him. He was kicking with both legs, even the broken one. Frantically, he began to try and claw his way up the vertical walls of the shaft. At first, I couldn't tell what the big deal was, but then I saw it. My jaw dropped in horror, my heart filled with disgust. My mind recoiled in terror as I realized Ray was at the bottom of a pit with a decomposing body. The fear was real, the panic was real. Ray looked up at me with tear-filled eyes. He was begging and pleading for me to get him out. I was completely helpless, completely confused. I have never learned what to do in a situation like this. I was completely speechless and in shock. What I did next is something I am completely ashamed of and doubt I will ever forget about. I stood up as quick as I could and ran up the basement stairs. I could hear Ray crying for me to stop, but I kept going. As I blasted out the front door, Ray's voice became entangled with the breeze. I kept running toward the truck and down the road. At some point, I stopped hearing Ray screaming and could only hear my breathing. Running down the darkening desert, I never stopped. Although the sun had been down for maybe an hour, it was still over 90 degrees. I ran till it felt like my legs would give out on me. My lungs felt like they were going to collapse. My cell phone and backpack filled with water was left in the basement, with my screaming friend. The chance of dehydration was now. After a while, my run turned into a slow jog, and before I knew it, I was walking but it wasn't for long. Up ahead of me in the distance, I saw the silhouette of a car, so again I began to run. The two teenagers were startled when I ran up to the driver's window. Of course, they were hesitant to help me. I probably looked like a crazy man, sweating, babbling about my friend and a decaying dead body. I caught the kids in the act of smoking marijuana, so it took them a few minutes to realize I didn't care about that, and I actually needed help. I think what really made up their minds was when I began to cry a bit. The ride back to town was short, but seemed to last forever. After a phone call, it only took three minutes for a squad car to show up and begin to question me. I told him everything, from the morning to when I found the two teenagers. I didn't rat them out, of course. An ambulance wasn't far behind to check me out. The EMT said I was dehydrated and needed an IV. 
As they began to drive off with me in the back, I saw a helicopter shining its light off in the distance. Relief washed over me like a calming wave of ecstasy. The feeling was so immediate and powerful I passed right out. Other than being dehydrated, I was unharmed. Ray on the other hand suffered a broken leg, a broken rib, and a sprained wrist. The physical trauma that he suffered that day was nothing compared to the mental scars that he had. From the time he discovered the dead body wrapped in the tarp, and him being rescued, Ray spent three hours with it. No matter who you are, that would be a really hard thing to do. The body had been down there for two weeks, and probably would have remained down there forever if we didn't come along. The old shaft house had been used by drug addicts in the past, and the police figured that one of them must have killed another one, put them in the tarp, dropped them down the hole, and tried to cover it with the wood and basement door. The victim still remains a John Doe. I can't say that I walked away completely unharmed. I still dream of the terror I felt that day. The dreams are never anything specific. Just me standing in a dark place feeling absolutely terrified. I can sometimes hear the screams of my old friend in the background, begging me for help. And like a coward, I run. Only to awake from my sleep and remember the whole day all over again. I often tell myself that Ray had it way worse and should be more supportive and sympathetic towards him. It's been 15 months since I have seen Ray. It's not that we aren't friends or anything. Sometimes it's hard for me to find the time after work to drive north for an hour. The psychiatric hospital he stays at now is quite nice. Every time I do see him, I feel so guilty. That look in his eyes, it tells me everything. It tells me that he's scared. It tells me that he's lonely. And it also tells me that he blames me. This is why I don't see Ray anymore. I'd like to start by saying that I hate hiking, and I would much rather stay inside and exercise in the comfort of my own home, where people can't see how embarrassingly out of shape I am. That being said, I don't live far from a national park. With beautiful rock formations, caves, and waterfalls, a large group of people from my graduating class had arranged for a day of hiking in the park. I agreed mostly because I felt like I would be missing out otherwise. We decided to schedule the hike for a week after our graduation ceremony, and when the time came it was just under 80 of us. 80 sweaty, loud teenagers crammed into a caravan of vehicles. Barring the incessant chattering and occasional elbow to the groin, the ride to the park was a snap. It was as soon as we got there that things started to veer off course, both metaphorically and literally. The second car in our group hit a beaver, and it got jumbled in the tires and caused them to go off-road and into a thicket of shrubs. I guess that should have been our first clue. We weren't even near the river yet. After that, one of the girls in our group started to get these awful headaches. She claimed that she could feel pressure in her ear and that they were popping, and we let her and a few others stay behind to watch the cars. Our journey continued. The park was magnificent with towering spires of half-broken trees jutting out of rock walls, and rippling streams running off into crevices in the ground. There was moss everywhere, and it was picturesque. Some of our party branched off to go to the local swimming hole, and the rest of us, nearly 20 people, trudged onward. The deeper we got into the park, the denser and quieter it got. The trees had grown so closely together that they ate away at the trail until we were scraping our shoulders and packs on their trunks. It was silent. No sounds of running water. There wasn't any sign of life in the woods apart from the crunch of sticks under our boots. The trees began to open, and the path widened into a small clearing. It seemed almost man-made. The large patch of exposed earth was about 50 feet in diameter and not an inch of it was covered with grass. The dirt was untouched by nature. A girl who we'll call Haley had wandered to the center of the clearing. I knew Haley from school. She was smart and a cute girl, the kind that made you perk up after a shitty day. Haley never seemed to let anything bother her. I'd never heard her scream, not until now. 
By the time we looked, Haley was already disappearing into the ground. All at once, it seemed like the forest boomed to life. A moss of blackbirds erupted from the tree line, squawking wildly and flitting away from the clearing. Tree limbs cracked, echoing and covering up the sound of Haley's screams. I threw my pack to the ground and darted after her, expecting there to be some kind of drop-off or small embankment that she'd trumbled down. I thought I'd see her crouched down there, ready to spring up and scare me. But there wasn't any embankment, merely a perfect circle in the ground, a hole that barely measured two feet wide. It was the perfect size to swallow up both Haley and her pack. I tried to call out to her, to reach into the hole and feel its edges. Nothing. It was as if it were merely a black spot on the earth, a mark with no mass, no landscape on the other side. Nothing but darkness and what seemed like an expanse of emptiness. Those of us not too shaken up by the ordeal began stripping our packs of climbing rope and whatever materials we could find. I fumbled with the lines, securing them to me and handing the rest off to the group. Lower me down and I'll tug once I hit the bottom. Was all I said before I descended into the hole. It was a tight squeeze, but I made it through the opening. Once I was in, I could feel the dirt walls around me. It was massive. Carefully, I looped the hole from my waist, enough to give me some slack. They lowered me down farther, and that's when I heard it. Flapping. The first instinct in me was that it was a bird overhead, but when I looked up at the hole's entrance, it was tiny. I hadn't realized how far down I'd gone. I grabbed for my cell phone and turn the flashlight on. It illuminated only my face, barely making a cut into the darkness. I shine the light around me, squinting to try and make out shapes. The fluttering grew more intense, louder, and I swallowed roughly. Haley, is that you? I called. It's okay. I'm coming to get you. The sound got closer, and then I heard it. A scream. It wasn't Haley's, and I could barely call it human. A sudden whoosh of air blew my hair back, and out of the darkness came a scrambled mess of shapes, blacker than anything I'd seen and quicker than hell. It lunged and in an instant, the line had been spliced. I was sent falling, just like Haley. I could hear and feel them all around me. These things. They flitted to and fro, circling me and wailing. Some of them scraped my arms and left gashes, taking pieces of my shirt and flecks of skin with them. I cried out and the fall felt as though it lasted minutes. When I finally stopped falling, I expected to be at the bottom of a cave system, with a broken leg and the darkness around me to worry about. Instead, I fell towards a speck of white. It grew opening up into a blue circle, and then I felt the impact. My chest slammed into the side of it, and my arm went through. But I didn't feel any pain, I just felt air, and a chilly breeze hitting my arm and making the hairs on it rise. There, pull him up! The ground hit me like a sack of bricks, and my dirt-covered clothes were no longer torn. The only thing out of place was my disheveled hair. What happened to you? Where is Haley? What did you see? There are questions I still can't answer. In the years since it happened, I've only been able to think about Haley and wonder what hole she came out of on the other side, or if whatever was down there didn't let her leave. <laughs>